when I was like, I might have been like 13 or 14 years old, sitting on my couch in my parents' living room next to my dad, watching LL Cool J perform <gasps> on the Soul Train Music Awards. And I remember he walked out with his running suit, his Kango, performed the first verse of I'm Bad. And I looked at the TV and then looked at my dad and I was like, dad, that's what I want to do. You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the app store for free today. Killer Keller. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, central London or central as you deserve to be, need to be, should be, want to be. All right, hold tight, graffitings.co.uk, Strain Station, and all other supporters. If you've got the Television app, you know what it is free download for your sport and art and street culture or music and what have you. It's all there for you. Uh, we are going to go. We're going to go our transatlantic to New York City, NYC, to meet a gentleman, to talk with a gentleman. That without question, if I was to say he wasn't an influence, I would be lying. Uh, in my early informative beatbox years, he was one of the pioneers that I looked up to, along with his other, uh, other, uh, these other gentlemen of, of uh, the turntablist world. Um, formation known as executioners and this gentleman right here without question is the funky operator of the whole shebang with a career spanning longer than a lot of us would you please give it up wherever you are for mr rob swift how are you gentlemen uh, i'm feeling old after that introduction but <laughs> but appreciative man and very thankful that i've lasted this long in this art form man Lasted this how long did how long did you think you would last? Curiously. That's a great lead-off question, man. I don't necessarily feel like when I started DJing at 12 years old that I plotted out the way my career would go. Mm. It, it's always been a one foot in front of the other sort of thing for me. I think big picture, I knew what I was capable of. And hearing myself say that, I think back to when I was like, I might have been like 13 or 14 years old, sitting on my couch in my parents' living room next to my dad, watching LL Cool J perform <gasps> on the Soul Train Music Awards. And I remember he walked out with his running suit, his Kango, performed the first verse of I'm Bad. And I looked at the TV and then looked at my dad and I was like, dad, that's what I want to do. That's exactly wow. what I want to do. <laughs> and the funny thing about the story is my dad looked at me and laughed. He, I don't think, had the foresight that I did, obviously. But mm. my dad's an immigrant to this country. He migrated here to the States in the late 1960s from Colombia. And so all he knew was working, you know, and, and mm. busting his ass at a factory. But for whatever reason, I just, I understood the potential of where DJing could take me. And the cool thing about the story, that's the funny thing that my dad turned to me and laughed. But the cool thing about the story is last August, I performed with LL Cool J here in New York City at Central Park. So God, it doesn't get it was better like, than that. It, it doesn't get better than that. <laughs> it was like I it's it, like I predicted it back when I was like 14. Now all of the steps that I had to take to make it to August 2021 on a Central Park stage with LL Cool J were steps that I just took 
organically. It's not like I necessarily schemed this whole thing mm-hmm. <laughs> that I've experienced with DJing. I just kind of put one step in front of the other. And that seed that I planted back when I was 14, telling my dad, that's what I want to do, just you know, sprouted into all these different cool opportunities. So Mm. to answer your question, I'm not necessarily sure that I knew I was going to have the longevity that I did. I just knew that there was potential in this and I took it one day at a time. Serendipity, a little bit of butterfly. I don't know the the synergy in that alone. And it's not the first time I've heard that there's, there is a crossing of paths that when you're going in the right direction, it, and you don't necessarily have to be spiritual in thinking it. I happen to believe that, yeah, actually, that there is something that is guiding all of us to do certain things. But when it is so in front of you and you you remember that snapshot of a moment when you were with your pops and that that in your head happened, it's, it's uncanny, isn't it? It is. It is. And I'm not afraid to say that there is a force that guides you, whether you believe in that force or not. So. Mm-hmm. You know, we all breathe air. We don't see it. It's not like we necessarily can touch it, but we know we're breathing it. Mm. And so I feel that's the same case with me and a lot of my other contemporaries that have made it this far with this amazing art form. You know, you got to have faith in every step you're taking, even when you feel like you might you might fall. You yeah. have to be able to have faith that whatever it is that's guiding you will pick you up. And that's Mm -hmm. been my experience throughout all of these years doing this. Uh, It's, you know, the journey hasn't been smooth sailing the whole time. I've had my downfalls. I've experienced Mm -hmm. my challenges, you know, I've walked through my valleys, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, all of those experiences, the scary ones, where you're opening up your laptop, checking your bank account, and you only have $50 in your checking account. Mm-hmm. You know, those are the times that like, now I can appreciate experiencing because when you see that, when that happens, whatever challenge you may be referencing, it, if depending on the kind of person that you are, mm-hmm. it motivates you to get up off your ass and make something happen. Um, and that force is going to help you, you know? So yeah, that's been my experience since day one with this whole art form, man. And I'm thankful to God because I feel like he's lined me up perfectly, yeah. perfectly, man. I can't even argue, you know, I can't even get mad when, when, you know, an opportunity may not necessarily move or open up for me the way I intend it in my mind to open up. I Mm. can't even be mad because at the end of the day, like I know that there's a bigger force at work and yeah, man, things happen for a reason. And Mm. I'm in a really good place right now with this art form Mm. and just your introduction, dude, I think confirms that for me. So, so yeah, Uh, this whole, whole thing has been a blessing for real, for real. And just to add value to what you're saying is, is, um, respectfully, I think hip hop, um, At its simplest, can be quite a cheap to enter culture. But what you have to do when going in there with the peers around you is you just have to be excellent. Just be Mm -hmm. excellent. Do do not for a second front. And I agree. Do you know what I mean? Because they not only would they sniff you out, like you ain't got no place to be in the hip. You you got you. It's it's a me instant competition. Athleticism has to be built in you, but there also has to be a creative drive. And and if you excel past the norm in a cheap to enter space, you just got to focus on that North star, right? You just got to keep going for that North star. I agree. I think pushing yourself, not settling is important, especially with hip hop because the framers of this culture, this art form prided themselves on being the best they can be, whether it was breaking, writing graffiti, rhyming, or DJing. You wanted to stand out. 
and you practiced your craft and you perfected it and mastered it as best you could. So when you approach, in this case, you know, I'm a DJ. So if you approach DJing with that mentality of not settling and just reaching for the best version of who you are, mm -hmm. people see that and they like it. And when, and when you get a bunch of people to like what you do, that's where the longevity comes. That's right. Oh my goodness. Yeah. You, you hit the nail on the head. Longevity, Mr. Swift. Right. So I went in. Okay. And I hope none of this information punks me out because, you know, as a fan, you know what I mean? And, and a, a, a presumptuous one at that, you know, I grew up in my later years, admittedly of, of uh, early twenties, completely in awe about the catalog and the way that executioners approached their, 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 the art form and their musicality. The albums alone were just like, what the fuck? no one's done this before. But here's what happened to me. I decided to jump on your wiki, right? And, you know, I don't normally do this stuff, but I'm like, yo, can I just run a list of what, you got, what you've done over the years of, of your musicality, just so everyone's up to speed here? Sesame Street, Blue Man Group, Herbie Hancock, Lincoln Park, Good Charlotte, Fat Joe, LL Cool J. That's just for starters. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. It is. It is. I think as a DJ, it's important to take yourself seriously with regards to the industry side of this genre of music. And when you deal with people and you operate in a business manner and you're professional, mm. you make an impact on the people that you're collaborating with. And that impact has ripple effects, mm. you know? So I feel like for someone else, it may have stopped at working with Herbie Hancock. Mm -hmm. Right. But for, for me, that momentum just kept building because of the quality of work. Mm -hmm. And the pride I take in what I do when I'm collaborating with these people. So it's like that energy just snowballs and, mm -hmm. and that momentum just keeps going and it becomes unstoppable, mm -hmm. you know? So anyone watching us right now thinking to themselves, well, you know, I just won this battle. I'm the baddest DJ in the world. Mm -hmm. Don't feel or confuse that accomplishment with the fact that you still don't have to be the champ at collaborating with the people that you might jam with on a stage, give yeah. it your all. Yeah. Don't feel like you, can, you don't have to be a champ at showing up on time when you get booked to DJ at an event. You know, like, yeah. you, 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 it's not just, my point is, it's not just about being the most skilled. Mm -hmm. It's about having the kind of impact on people that you're working with, whether it's creative people, people that run a club, whatever the scenario, you want to present your best and put your, your, all of you into mm. that situation and when you do that again you create momentum that's like unstoppable but there are skilled talented djs out there that think that championship title is enough you know and it's not it's not you gotta you gotta be a well-rounded artist yeah. and it and not just from a skill point of view from a people person mm. aspect as well for sure. When you're collaborating with the, I mean, the range of, 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 of artists, I mean, you know, you've gone from jazz to kids programs, to rock and roll, to a straight up boom bap. And, and then some, um, there's, there's some hours involved in that. And like you say, yeah, there's, man. there's people skills, there's, there's craft. Tell me about, tell me about the craft and DJ, like for somebody that, you know, is an artisan and has an expertise that has 
surpassed, uh, you know, an, an average DJ's career. Like you've gone into all different walks. Like, well, tell me about the craft. Tell me what you, how deep do you go in the craft of, of DJing? I mean, you mentioned the, the club scenarios as well as the battling, but you, you indulge a bit more. I mean, the craft is a means for you to discover who you are, you know, and I don't mean to sound like this, like, you know, prophet or like this deep spiritual, you know, DJ Yogi, you know, Mm -hmm. that's not what I'm trying to do. But, but honestly, I feel that I've had the success that I've had because through DJing, I've been able to discover myself and that comes out in my music. Uh, yes, and people that's right. Appreciate that. You yeah, know what I mean? Real. So yeah. I think I think what separates someone like myself who, you know, I don't have a booking agent, I don't have a manager, but somehow I seem to stumble across some of the most progressive opportunities that a DJ could ever experience. Just Last month, the U.S. Embassy to Bogota, Colombia, in the South, mm. uh, in South America, mm-hmm. invited me to be an uh, artist envoy. And <sighs> I took part in a celebration of 200 years of friendship between Colombia and the United States. What? And, yeah, you, it you was know, an amazing ladies and gentlemen, Are you listening to this, ladies and gentlemen? Rob Swift is talking that shit right now. Yeah. Come on. And the thing about it, the Wicked. thing about that, bro, is that I am Colombian. My yeah. parents migrated to New York City from Colombia. So the full circle aspect of that is just insane. But I think that whether it's recording songs like Salsa Scratch on my album, the, um, on my album Sound Event, Mm-hmm. A, a, a song that featured scratching, but was about my heritage as a Colombian, Afro-Colombian here in, in this country. You know, my mom is speaking Spanish on a song at the beginning, like stuff like that. Again, like you're just Yo. planting these seeds yeah. and creating momentum. And to kind of tie it all together, the point that I'm trying to make is that I didn't just in the case of that song, just make a song about me scratching a thousand miles per hour and showing off and look how technical my scratches are. Mm. It was about who I am using this creativity of mine and through DJing, showing my fans, anyone that listened to that album, who I am through Mm. sound. You know what I mean? So then when you approach your craft in that way, you just make a different kind of impact on people that you won't if you're just focusing on scratching a ah, thousand miles per hour over a scratch beat. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, mm. so that's the thing for me about craft that I feel I understand. And I've always figured out creative ways to implement and, and share with my audience. You know what I mean? That it's more than how fast your scratches are and how Mm. technical and what battle you won. And it's so much more to this art form than that. And it starts Mm. with showing yourself. It starts with, you know, figuring out a way through this medium of DJing, of connecting with people. And when you do that, the longevity comes, the opportunities come. and I feel I'm a great example of that. For real, for real. Turntablism, man. And you, it's like the, it's the, 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 it's a conduit. It's like, and I use this quite a lot because I'm a big Slash fan, you know, as I said, as a kid, you know, he, he speaks with his guitar and in a, in a vastness of, of DJing where it's limitless, there's limitless op- options and things you could do, you know, sampling, like you say, scratch a million miles an hour, a little bit Eddie Van Halen, you know what I mean? But, but then there's the funkier side of it, the more kind of no uh, assuring side of that scratch uh, genre, you know? How do you, 
how do you balance that? How do you let uh, DJing and turntablism be the conduit you need? How do you how do you restrict yourself and you're able to make you know Rob Swift come through on the turntables? How do you do that? That's a great question. Um, I think it starts with not being a follower, mm. not being afraid to trailblaze. Mm. And to give you an example, when I competed, I'm going to reference competing because a lot of the people watching us taking in what we're discussing might mm-hmm. be DJs that want to compete in battles like the DMC, for example. Mm-hmm. Pick up all the DJ crew. I know they were watching. Yeah, watching. Cool. sure. Yeah. And so when I first started battling, I remember, well, you know what? I'll even take it back. Before take it back. Then. Yes, right. Take it back. Leading up to when I actually entered my first battle in 1991, I was practicing by myself. And what I was basically doing was watching the DJs that I looked up to, guys like Cash Money, hmm. DJ Aladdin, hmm. Cut Master Swift Sick. from the UK. Yeah, man. Uh, Jazzy Jeff, Steve D. I'd watch these DJs and teach myself their style, the way wow. they touched the records, everything that they were doing to the records. I would basically break down into learnable chunks. <sighs> and then I, and then I would put together everything that I learned. So if, if cash money had a routine on an LL Cool J song, I would teach myself that routine. And then a lot of times I would invite my junior high school friends, my high school friends over to my house and Mm. I'd perform for them. They'd sit down on my mom's couch and they'd watch me recreate these routines by Cash Money and Aladdin and Cutmaster Swift. And fortunately, a friend of mine named Juju, who later on became a well-known member of the Beat Nuts. As you do, yes. <laughs> you know, he and I grew up in the same neighborhood and one day he pulled me aside and he was like, yo, Rob, I'm going to take you to this guy, Dr. Butcher's house, man. You need to meet this guy. And I was like, dope, you know, uh, uh, fine. You know, at the time I thought I was like the best DJ in my neighborhood. So I heard of the name Dr. Butcher and in my head, I remember thinking, oh, this guy's going to be blown away with what I could do because Mm. I could scratch like Jazzy Jeff. I could beat juggle like Steve D. I could do body tricks like Cash Money and Aladdin. Like who in this neighborhood is doing any of that? Mm. And I remember walking into this house, him greeting me. And then Butcher was like, yo, man, let's, let's get to it. And I'm all excited, young, hungry. I go on the turntables first. I get off feeling super confident. Mm -hmm. And then he got on and just completely obliterated. I mean, decimated everything that I did (laughs) because, and it's not like he was competing with me. Mm -hmm. It's not even like he was competing with me. I think if anything, I was competing with him Mm -hmm. secretly, but It's more like he wanted to show me that he was original Mm -hmm. and that his his creativity revolved around his own organic self and sense of expression. And without verbally telling me that, I understood the difference between where he was as a DJ and where I was as a DJ. Mm. And I remember when he got off the stage, um, <laughs> stage, it felt mm. like I was watching him on the stage. Yeah, but totally. when he got off his turntables, yeah, I looked at him and I was like, yo, I was like, yo, you got, please teach me. Like, yeah, yeah. like those young students in, in the martial arts movies, you know, like kneeling down, take me as your master kind of thing. Like, so good. I was like, dude, like, please teach me. And I, and, one of the first things that he told me, he was like, Rob, like you're dope, man. You're dope. The thing about it is you're dope right now at copying. 
you're dope at like learning something that someone else does, someone else's style, mm. someone else's self of expressing their take on on what we do as DJs. He was like, dude, what we got to train you to be is yourself, unique, Sick. so that you can stand out. And yeah. I was sold. I was sold, man. And and that moment, I thank Juju. I've referenced this story in a lot of my history and a lot of my interviews mm. because it changed everything. It changed everything for me as a DJ. And it, and it pointed me in the direction that I needed to be pointed in. Mm. And so to this day, man, I'm thankful to Juju. I love that guy. He's like a big brother to me. He's one of the um, nicest dudes as well. I love that guy. Yeah, man. Yep. And and just talented in what he's contributed to hip hop is, I mean, you know, we could have a whole other interview about that. Um, but you I'm guys, really... you guys, if I could just add to that, like mm-hmm. you guys have a real, there's a real um, similarity. That I think it's an era, it's an era thing because uh, the craft within that, you know, mid to late nineties and some were very much in keeping with um contributing. You're adding sure. to the craft. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Rather now than you're taking. Nowadays it's taking. But yep. you guys were from that era. So I, I hold you very much one in the same, I would say, Rob. I love what you just said. That I feel is what Dr. Butcher was trying to instill in me when I met him that day in his bedroom. Mm-hmm. That I was taking ideas from other DJs and assuming that it was giving me power. Yeah. And if anything, it was holding me back from being myself. And that's what people needed to see was who Rob Swift is. So, you know, a lot of the theme behind the things that we're talking about in this interview, it really boils down to being authentic, being true to yourself, allowing yourself to be guided. You know, Mm. I think, imagine if I would have told Juju, I'm not going to that guy's house for what? Can you imagine? Imagine. Wow. Imagine. that I I would not, I know for a fact, I would not be here talking to you right now. So I was being guided and I allowed it. You know, Juju, Mm. for whatever reason, felt inspired you know, he saw that, like, I was serious about DJing. Yeah. He liked me as a person. We hung out. He knew my older brother. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. for all these different reasons, he was like, you know what, man? I think I'm going to help Rob out and take him to Dr. Butcher's house and expose him to another side of this DJ shit. And if I would have said no or or for whatever reason, you know, went and hung out with some girl the day that I was going to go to his house or hung out with my friends or whatever it is that might have distracted me. I would not be here today, man. So allowing yourself to be guided, knowing when there's an opportunity in front of you to jump on it and appreciate it and make Mm -hmm. the most of it. Listening, you know, like when when Drew, Dr. Butcher told me like, dude, man, we got to get you to just be authentic rob that's what we got to work on mm-hmm. like you got the skill you got the skill we got to teach you how to be authentic and and show yourself through the djing that mm-hmm. you like you know what i mean and that you do if i would have not listened again i would not be here in front of you today so it's crazy when you think about it it's crazy when i think about it because your contribution and for those of you that are just living under some rock you know what i mean get, just get to know you have this um there's an attitude visually to 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 you and how you you uh, you dj and mix live and then there's the the production side as well which i know you you know you really put you know you double down on as well when you're and and we've gone through the the list, the A to Z of who you worked with. But you know, in the in the in the for the concept of um, the supergroup executioners, first time, like I said, it was forward thinking. The production value also was rich, man. It was so sick. And how did you how did you transfer those skills? How did you transfer the DJing into production like that? 
it was easy. It, I don't even think that there was necessarily a process to it. The natural progression for a DJ to make is producing. I think that as a DJ, for example, the kind of DJing that I do, I produce already on turntables. You're taking drum sounds, rearranging them. Uh -huh. You're forming these like collages of like music, but all fragmented out of different songs and different mm -hmm. artists. It's the same thing with production, you know, whether you're using a, an, an MPC or a turntable, it's about accumulating these different sources of sound and then piecing it together in a way that you hear in your mind without necessarily hearing it, really mm -hmm. hearing it. You kind of, it's like your spirit is telling you what to do next, you know, uh, what baseline to search for next, or in the sense of putting together a set, oh man, these two songs will work together. And mm -hmm. it's not like anyone is telling me that you just feel this impulse, something comes over you and inspires you to check to see if these two songs go together. And guess what they do? Mm -hmm. Oh man, now, now where can I go? I, so producing dj it's to me all the same thing the only thing that might be different is the operation of the gear so with turntables you got to understand how to pick the needle up drop it on the record how to apply the proper hand mechanics on the yeah. turntables but when you're producing if you're on mp on an mpc or an sp1200 or whatever the case is you know, you got to understand how to sample what significant pads, yeah. you know. You yeah. know so it's just a different order of operation, but the creativity is the same. You know what I mean? So yeah, I do. It's, just, it's just like a learning curve that you got to experience understanding how to work the different gear, whether it's DJ equipment or production equipment. But the creativity involved, it's the same exact thing. So I can't necessarily say that it was a process. Like, I just went right into it, you know, and and mm. thank God that I did because then I went on to make albums, yeah. do remixes, you know, and, and take my creativity to the next level and grow. But you know, you know and that's is, really though? the whole point. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know what it was that was era defining for its time, though? And, and, and I'll, I want I'd like to stay here just for a second, because for me, when it was the idea of it. So you guys, Rob Swift, Mr. Sinister, Rock Raider, Total Eclipse, came together, made an album. Well, built, built from scratch, then Expressions, two extremely awesome albums, right? And well, just projects, because when I think about it, like you guys were adding value to a scene and what was inspiring from mine and a handful of others was the idea that okay you, the, the, the horse is in front of the cart now the cart was you guys would go on stage with two four six eight eight turntables sometimes i guess and would be simulating the instrumentation to create um a body of work a landscape of sound a battle routine or whatever but what you had done with the albums was you were creating the music first. And what inspired me as a beatboxer, especially, was like, yo, I wonder, they, they're going to recreate this live? That's crazy. It's almost like complete role reversal to anything that we were seeing firsthand in the turntable world. It was almost like, here's the music. Now come and see us and see us how we do it. That's crazy. Mm. It is. It is. I think, again, trailblazing mm. and knowing that or trusting probably is a better word trusting that your ideas were going to work mm. you know there were things that myself rock raider rest in peace mm. mr sinister total eclipse we would share these ideas with each other and then help that person bring to fruition that idea mm. 
And, and we would never tell each other, no, that's a bad idea or no, that's not going to work. And if, if there was an idea that was brought to the table that one of us or a few of us felt wasn't necessarily quite there, mm. then we would scheme out how to bring that idea forth to a point that we all did feel comfortable about it. Mm. So there was just a trust in each other. And I think because of that, we had the success that we did with all the crazy stuff that we tried out. Crazy. You know, in the, in the studio, on stage, in battles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. And I appreciate that about being a member of the, the executioners and rocking with those guys because that's not always the case when you work in groups. A lot of times when you work in groups, someone may have an idea that might need some nurturing, but if it's just not quite there, the other members might be like, oh, let's just pass on that and move on to something mm -hmm. else. But I, that wasn't the experience with us. We would, we would work together. Mm -hmm. And that then brought a whole other experience to the process of recording music and performing, for example, because, you know, when you work together, then you're like, Yo, man, it's like, I, I don't smoke weed, right? But I would mm -hmm. assume that it's so, that it's similar to that in that, like, you know, when you're with your friends and everyone's kind of like passing a joint around and you're talking and you're kind of like, you're, e each of you are sort of reaching this like higher level of like understanding. So sick. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I feel like I would experience the same sort of vibe when I would DJ with Raider and practice with Sinister and just sit down and talk with, with Total Eclipse and Dr. Butcher, mm. it's like you're, you're elevating your perception of things. Yeah. You know what I mean? And in our case, it was music. We, you know, we'd get together and an energy would just kind of like start to culminate and we would just reach this higher level of perception and in reaching that level, then we were there and then it's, all right, let's practice. Let's now put this into physical form. You know what I mean? And so that was just like a very fun period in time. And I miss that, man. You know, Raider is no longer with us. Mm. Total Eclipse lives in Australia now. You know what I mean? Every Hold now on, so he, he lives might, in Australia? Yeah, he moved to Australia years ago. He got married. Wow. He got married. Yeah. So he's not around. And it's not to say that I don't connect with Mr. Sinister because he and I have a thing called the odd couple that mm -hmm. we do. And we've toured together and we've posted some really fun videos on YouTube, for example. Mm -hmm. But it'll never be the same like it was with the four of us. Um. What was it Mike Tyson once said, you know, a happy a happy boxer is a is a well trained champion boxer. And I'd cut you know, like even for beatboxing, I think it's a young man's sport. You know, you've got to kind of have that freedom, that happiness, that kind of you know, low rent responsibilities and just go for it. And mm -hmm. I would argue that's probably the case with with DJing. And it's a romantic idea to think you know, what if, you know, or I, I wish I could have that back. But you do hit, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I would imagine you might hit a ceiling where you're just like, well, actually, I've, I've reached a peak. I have to pass on the gauntlet and my contribution is fixed in the history. But what else can I do? You, you must have had that feeling. I always ask, what else can I do? And I think that's why I've had the longevity that I've experienced as a DJ. I started out making tapes for friends in junior high school. Then eventually the principal of my junior high school found out that I was this young DJ hmm. and asked me to DJ the junior high school dance. Mm -hmm. Then it was like, what else can I do? 
people started asking me, well, yo, you DJ, um, can you DJ my 13th, you know, birthday party? Uh, sure. Why not? You know, why not spread my name in my neighborhood? And so I started DJing birthday parties for friends. And then it was like, well, what else can I do? Mm -hmm. And then I remember I had a friend who had an, like an uncle that owned a nightclub in our neighborhood. I live in Jackson Heights, Queens. He owned a nightclub called the Riviera on, is it Astoria? It's in Astoria. On on uh, Steinway Street <laughs> for all my Queens heads. Oh, tight um, Queens. Yeah, and he was like, "Yo, man, my uncle owns a bar there. Like, yo, I think that I could set it up so that you could DJ there for a night." And remember, this is me at like 14, 15 years old. I wasn't even twenty one, wow. and I DJed inside this nightclub. You know, a fifteen year old kid. That's you know? crazy. Um, <laughs> yeah, insane. I remember that. And then it was like, well, what else can I do? Yeah. And so I started discovering that there was more to DJing than just making people dance, that mm. there was this whole other art taking place. And guys like Cash Money, Jazzy Jeff, Aladdin, mm. Cutmaster Swift, Mixmaster Ice were at the forefront of, mm -hmm. of this new style of DJing. And so I started a train and then, what else can I do? And then I met Dr. Mm. Butch and then what else can I do? And I remember by like the mid nineties, at least here in New York city, we were the shit. Like you couldn't tell us nothing. Like everyone knew who we were, especially yeah. in the battle scene. Yeah. And I was DJing for Akinelli. Rock Raider was DJing for Showbiz and AG. Mr. Wow. Sinister was Commons DJ. Wow, and yeah. Total Eclipse was DJing for Organized Curve organized confusion and Jeez. i remember though there came a point where i started feeling like all right i dj for akinelli i've been on a road and i'm thankful but what else can i do like yeah. there has to be more to this experience than just mm. djing for a rapper like th there has to be more to it mm. and I remember I sat Raider down, Sin, Eclipse. You could ask Eclipse or Sinister to this day. And I literally told them, I was like, yo, there's more to this shit. And right now, each of us are eating off the plate of the rappers or yeah. rap group that we DJ for. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yo, I want my own plate. Raider, I want you to have your own plate. Same for you, Sin and E. I was like, dude, like we gotta like think about the future and establishing ourselves as artists independently of the groups and artists that we DJ for. Mm -hmm. And they got it. They got it. It clicked with them as well. And we left our prospective artists. I left Akinelli, Sin left Common. Raider left Showbiz and AG and Tony Eclipse left Organized Confusion. And guess what? We ended up releasing our first album, Expressions, on an independent label called Asphodel. That's right. Yeah. And so I could keep going with the, and now what? And now what am I going to do? You know, I like, I, I ask myself that question periodically, like maybe every five years, mm -hmm. you know? And here I am. 2022, I run my own school, my own DJ school, and I teach people how to connect with themselves worldwide, you know, wow. and I'm giving back to this art form. And so because I've asked, well, what else can I do with regards to this whole DJing discipline? Mm. Again, that's where the longevity comes. And that's why I've experienced all of the different cool things that i've experienced you know you got to keep asking that question man now what now mm. where do i go mm. and it's almost like in asking it's like the universe hears that and then decides all right i'll show you what the next thing is going to be but if you just i don't know relax into 
oh, I, you know, I have this residency every Friday night at the local Yeah, I'm just going to do that for a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. If, if you relax into, oh, man, I just won this battle. I'm yeah. the shit. Everyone thinks that, like, I'm the best DJ in the world. If you relax into that and you don't see past it and you don't ask, now what? You're going to miss out on a lot of cool stuff. That's right. You're, you're, you're as good as digging your own kind of hole to fall into, right? Exactly, because in static means you're not growing, mm. you know, and life is movement. And so it's important, man, to like move and do different things and have fun while you're at it and make the most of the different situations that you might experience yourself in. For mm -hmm. me, it started off making tapes for friends and spreading my name. Then you're DJing birthday parties and then you're DJing in clubs and then you're battling mm -hmm. and then you're touring. And then you're not just touring, but you're touring your brand, Rob Swift. Crazy. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah you got to. And now, you know, I'm, I'm running this DJ school. So at some point, I know I'm going to ask now what? And hopefully that force that we've been talking about through this entire interview will again, show me the way. And I have no doubt that that will be the case because why would it be any different exactly. today, you know, exactly. or tomorrow? Um, mom and dad still with us. Yeah. Thankfully they are. Mm -hmm. What does, uh, uh, what does your, what does your pops think of, uh, of your, you know, it, it's not to everybody. Right. And all they want to do is protect you because, you know, experiences, you know, passed down and they're thinking to themselves, hold on, he's reinventing himself again, but again, but again. Do you know what I mean? This is enough to make people worry, but what does your dad totally. think after all of this that's on this piece of paper that I've spelled out as, you know, critical acclaim? Like what what do they what do they think of of uh, of your career so far? I think my parents are proud, man. But they're also shocked. Like you said. <laughs> yeah. My mom and my dad come from Colombia and it's considered a third world country, you know, and mm. it's not like the average person in Colombia, especially when we're talking about the time frame that they were there living, mm. growing up, you know, their generation, all they, my, my family, man, I come from a family on my mom's, I'm sorry. On my dad's side mm -hmm. of miners, my dad's side of the family, they would mine. Wow. In, yeah, man. Wow. They were miners. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. not like I think my dad could appreciate what I was telling him when we were watching LL Cool J and I turned to him and said, that's what I want to do. I don't think he could appreciate or understood that there was potential there. For him, it's about working for a boss hmm. and getting that steady paycheck you know and yeah. that's the case for a lot of people not just colombians you know like oh, for sure fortunately we're socialized to work for someone hmm. you know and think that that is what we can rely on to be fed and yeah. to pay the bills you know what i mean but thankfully man for whatever reason I just knew that there was an alternative to that concept of living on this planet. You know what I mean? Mm. And thankfully, man, like I've never had to bust my ass for someone the way my dad has all his life. And thankfully I forged a way to pay my bills and put food on the table and buy my home. You know, I'm sitting from, my home, I own this apartment. Like I don't pay a rent. I don't even have a mortgage. You know what I mean? Like, and are you listening to this ladies? And gentlemen? Are you listening? Are you inspired? Yeah. Yet? Cool. And it came from DJing and it came from DJing from DJing man. from, from <laughs> moving, from moving a record back and forth and going wig it, wig it, wig it. So you know cold. what I mean? Like yeah. it is, it's super cold. But again, man, if you have trust in yourself, and believe in what your vision is, nothing can really stop you. You'll mm -hmm. experience obstacles. You'll experience some, 
you know, dark times. I'm not saying that it's all smooth sailing, mm. but those dark times, those obstacles just make you better mm. and you grow, you know? And then when you encounter the next, the next obstacle, you know how to navigate it. You know what I mean? Because mm. you've, you've been there already. So yeah, dude, it's been a blessing for sure. You are without question. I, and I know this will always dif- artists are sensitive by default, but I don't get the impression for a second that you know, you, it just feels to me like you're always on game A, like grateful in the moment, enjoying this experience that, that you've created for yourself, man. Yeah, that I created, but also that friends of mine have helped me create and also that God, whatever whatever the force is that we've been talking about that guides us has yeah. helped me as well. You know, like I, I, I know I know what you meant, but I just want to clarify that by no means, man, do I feel like I did this. Like I know that I was at the forefront of my experience, right? Yeah. Because it's my experience. But along the way, there have been people placed on my path to help me yeah. get to the next uh, experience, the next adventure. You know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah, without yeah. those people, whether it was like a, a, a Juju, a Dr. Butcher, mm. my par- my parents, you know, the funny thing is like, when you think about it, I, I said earlier, yeah, my parents are proud of me, but I also think they're shocked. But indirectly, my my dad helped me because mm-hmm. even though even though my dad laughed at me when I was like, yo, LL Cool J, that's what I want to do, dad. Like, I want to be on a stage like that. Mm-hmm. You know, even though he laughed at me, if he never would have made the decision to immigrate here to New York City, yes. I wouldn't be here talking to you. You know what I mean? By design, so it even, was for a better life or a different life. Right. So, for a better life. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's like. Even my dad, the one that like I think I know <laughs> would have rather me go to college, which I did. I got my degree in psychology and I did all that. Um, but I know that he would have rathered me pursue a professional quote unquote career. Yeah. Even he helped me because as you said, you know, like if he wouldn't have made that decision to come here to the States. I wouldn't have had the opportunities in front of me to take advantage of in DJ. You know what question. I mean? Hip hop was happening here in New York City, not in Colombia. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, man, it's crazy. So it's it's just nice to it's nice to hear somebody, you know, just super appreciative about the, the whole scenario of, of and how it plays out. And like you say, like these people in your, in, in your sphere, these people that are on your journey is contributive to the overall outcome. You know? For sure. A lot Definitely. of people like, I mean, you know, taking different scenarios. I mean, you know, you, you mentioned the production values of, you know, transferring DJing to, to, um, you know, to samplers, to, to computers, you know, very similarly people, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard for people to appreciate the simplicity of it. It's the simplicity of finding the right person to take you to that next step or just having friends that and family that it's to some people it's so it's it, 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 it's so not there. It's, it's, it's just so far removed from anything they'd experience. It's native. It's like, how, how about how do you do that? And I, I think that I guess that's from an artist's point of view, it's extremely hard to explain other than keep the faith, isn't it? Yeah, it is because we're socialized to be fearful, right? Yeah. So in the case of DJing, for example, my dad was fearful that I would fail because what are the chances that you're going to make a decent living mm. with this thing, Rob, that you do on turntables? Like, like, 
he was socialized to believe that a decent living meant working for someone that owned a factory mm. because you're getting a reliable check each week. You know what I mean? Yeah. With DJing, it's not something that you could rely on. Like, what if this? What if that? But if you could just... Fear is always going to be there. It's, it's sort of a human instinct that we can't necessarily erase out mm. of who we are as humans. But it's but an energy, right? You, and you can use that energy. If you use it the proper way, exactly. If you use it the proper way and put fear in its proper context, mm. then, then it just becomes like a, a part of the bigger experience of accomplishing what you are wanting to accomplish. And in mm. our case, we're talking about DJing. You know what I mean? But like, mm. you know, I'll, I'll here's, a, here's a really cool example. Do it. Again, back to, my, back to my parents. Like, I remember when I was a kid and my parents would take me to the beach. My mom, especially, whenever I would get close to the water, she would yell at me, Rob, don't get in the water. Don't mm-hmm. get in the water. Like you could drown. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah. so there was this fear there that like, I'm four or five years old. If, if I get into the water, I might drown. Yeah. Yes. That could happen. But if you teach me how to swim, I will be able to fend for myself in the water. You there know what you I go. mean? Yeah. And, and here's the thing, like, yo, for years, for years, I couldn't swim. I could not swim. I like, I like as an adult, I could not swim. And it was because my parents put that fear in my head that if I get in the water, I mm. could die. And it wasn't up until like two years ago, dude, that I was in Antigua with uh, an ex-girlfriend of mine. And, and I was like, yo, man, I want to learn how to swim. <laughs> and she taught, and she taught me how to swim. I'm, I'm an adult now, a grown man. In yeah. in the beach, in the beach where I could have drowned. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I learned how to swim, dude. And like that, yo, like I felt so accomplished and and just like finally, dude, after all these years, you know? That is so, so sick. It's just, yeah, it is. So it just kind of goes to show that Love like a lot, a lot of things could happen. A lot of things could go wrong, but a lot of things could could happen and a lot of things could go right. You know what I mean? So it's mm. like I got in the water and learned how to swim. So, you know, when it comes to DJing, I know that for a lot of people, there's this fear, right? There's this yeah. fear of like, well, yo, like, well, you know, I, well, if I run in a crew, then, you know, what if someone's better than me? And, you know, there's like doubt yeah. and like you have all these negative thoughts. And Without question. You just can't. Yeah, you can't have that, man. Mm. You can't can't second guess why you're in situations uh, make the most out of every experience man and and one foot in front of the other even if you're scared take that step and then mm-hmm. experience what you're going to experience from taking that step and you'll be okay ain't that something ain't that something what an inspiring conversation what an inspiring co- i mean you know I had no preconceived ideas other than I was going to be talking with Rob Swift. That was enough for me. The fact that the value in this episode alone has got me going away thinking and I'm actually feeling a level of gratitude. Do you mean more importantly for, for having you on the show, but, but also that, that feeling of, yeah, man, it's 2022. Do you know what I mean? It's one of those ones. We're still here. Do you know what I mean? The kids are still in the pool and we can swim. <laughs> man. Word. Um, what's the future, my brother? What's the future for Rob Swift? What's, what's, what's the future? I really don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> On that honestly, note. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, honestly, I don't really, I don't really plan for the future in that sense. Mm. You know, um, my whole mentality with my career has been make the most out of the opportunities that are in front of you. And when you do that, you create momentum that naturally takes you into the direction that you're meant mm. to be mm-hmm. in. And so 
I know that in the future, I'll be exactly where I'm supposed to be because that's what I felt when I was watching Hello Cool J and yeah. telling my dad, that's what I want to do. So like dope. I knew that that's where I was, I was meant to do that. And I didn't obsess over the steps that I was going to take to get there. I just one step at a time at that moment, at that moment in time, it was about being the best DJ that I could be and practicing and training and studying the art. And then things just kind of happen from there organically. So for now, man, I've just been really focusing my energy into helping people understand this art form from a personal perspective, mm. not just the techniques, but learning about the history. Again, I have a school called Brolic Army DJ School. I encourage yeah, everyone out there, if you haven't visited the website, log on, have a browse. Um, and, and just I spell teach. that one out again. The website Brolic Army DJ School. So B R O L I C A R M Y DJ School dot com. I launched it last year and it's been super successful. And I'm thankful to all the students that have trusted me to teach them. You know, people subscribe monthly, you could subscribe every six months or have a lifetime membership. And I appreciate people's trust and faith in what I have to teach them. And so I'm thankful, man, to all the students that I have worldwide. It's been great experiencing running this school. You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and not just making every day about, look at me, DJ. I'm going to post the video to Instagram or, yo, look at me. I'm going to be touring over here or look at me. Like I still tour. I still every once in a while showcase how nice I am on the turntables, but I'm in a phase now in my career where I'm really channeling my energy into helping others mm -hmm. tap into their creativity the same way Dr. Butcher helped me. And so it's been fun, very gratifying I wake up in the morning, not just feeling like this famous DJ, but I wake up in I wake up in the morning feeling like a mentor, like I'm useful and I'm helping people grow and eventually become their own dope DJs. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that that to me, man, right now is is everything. And that's where I'm channeling all of my energy. And I know that momentum will be created from that and I will naturally, you know, whatever that next step is for me, whenever that's going to happen, uh, I'll be ready for it. So I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I do know that right now things are great. Wow. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, you keep the faith, won't you? Rob Lord. Swift inside the place. Thank you so much, my brother. What a pleasure. Good job, man. Yeah, man. For real for real. Ladies and gentlemen, Rob Swift. Inside the place, you want to check some more DJ podcasts, they're coming right up, so hold tight. The next one's on the way. Whole manner DJs, a whole lot of conversation. Rob Swift inside the place, execution is hold tight. Killer Keller podcast, out like in was out of fashion. You stay lucky, you remember, all right? Take care of yourself. Sharing is caring. We're doing it like this. Killer Keller podcast, peace.